So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Zoe Barron from NICE, so that's the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Um, we're the body that oversee um, production of best practice guidelines in clinical care um, and also assess technologies about whether they're effective and if they're value for money when they're implemented in the NHS. Um, my role in NICE is looking at health technologies, so I oversee the guidance um, that's produced for health technologies and also lead on the strategic development side to make sure um, we're looking that we're fit for the future of all these brilliant technologies that are coming onto the market. Um, so today I thought I would touch upon um, a little bit about NICE strategy, how we're changing as an organisation, um, and also um, describe a, an approach that we've been doing in health technologies for this last year, piloting on a number of case studies. Um, so in terms of the NICE um, strategy, looking at NICE, we've been around a bit long, younger than PhD, we're a couple of years younger, I think 23 years old now. Um, and we are very much looking at how the pressures on the NHS, everyone's very aware of that. How can we produce guidance quicker? How can we um, make sure we're focusing on what really matters most to the NHS and people as well? Um, this is kind of a reinvigoration, I would say, of NICE. and so really looking at, um, as we've all heard, I think from all the speakers this morning, the pace of which technology is developing is much quicker than evidence generation and much quicker than we're looking at implementation in the NHS as well. So a lot of looking at how we work internally, but also looking about what we're producing as an organisation to see if we're actually helping the NHS and meeting their needs. Um, so as you can see here, our real ultimate aim is to get the best care to patients first and also make sure it's value for money, it's really important in the current economic climate um, as always. Um, as I've already mentioned, we want to focus on what matters most, so that's the topics we're selecting and what we're focusing on. We also want to make sure our advice is really useful and usable, so our guidance at the moment is, is quite wordy, I think is fair to say. Um, we're looking at how we make it a lot more um, interactive and a lot more, um, much simpler for people, putting things in boxes and just lay out and looking at what our website looks like as well. So quite simple changes in some that way, but I think will be really useful for people. And how can we produce um, really quick summaries of the key information that everybody needs to know? Everybody's very, very busy. So we're looking at lots of things like that. Um, and we're also looking at how we learn from data and implementation as well. So we've heard a lot about real world data. I think it's brilliant all the partners are aligned. I think we're all looking in the same direction, which is always fantastic to see. Um, but really looking at how we can get more information from the NHS when things are implemented, what can we use with, from that information to really inform our sense of value. So a lot of the value we look at NICE is driven by the patients, it's driven by our perception of society and looking at what we can do to really pull things back in real time to say actually this is something we want to focus on and something we, we're maybe a bit more willing to put money, pay money into as well. So that's sort of where we're at in terms of NICE and what we're working on already. Um, and then in terms of sort of what I've been doing this year, um, leading on a new approach within NICE. So we've called it early value assessment. I suspect that may change, but it's, uh, it's what we're living with at the moment. Um, and what we've really done is put a middle step in our production of guidance. So normally, historically, we would assess a, a technology um, and we'd see if it's effective, if it's value for money, and we'd make a recommendation about whether it can be used in routine adoption. So that is scaling it nationally across the NHS. It can be paid for, everyone can use it. And what we're looking at here with early value assessment is actually a lot of these technologies that are coming on the market now are reasonably low in evidence, but they're actually really meeting a really great unmet need in the NHS, and there's a real desire to use them. So can we assess those and the value of those more quickly and look at whether they can be safely used in the NHS while more evidence is generated? So if you look on this first piece here, sort of once we get, we've done the early value assessment of evidence, we then produce guidance about, yes, it can be used or no, it, it can't because it's not safe to do so, and then we also produce an evidence generation plan from NICE, which will tell you the key outcomes we want evidence to be generated on. So really helping all our partners to sort of say this is what we want to see, helping industry know what we want to see and bring that evidence back in. Once the evidence is generated and we can look at then use that evidence to see if the benefits that we think are realised in the NHS actually are. So we think this would be really useful as well in terms of what the NHS wants to see from us. If all of that is positive, then it would get a final recommendation for one to, for the routine adoption. We can scale it up across the NHS. So it, it manages uncertainty of when we're introducing technology in the, yes, in the NHS a bit better than it does right now and allows industry to work with us as well um, through that life cycle of a technology when it's starting out, building that evidence as we go through. The other attractive thing about this, I think, from my perspective in the health technologies is an awful lot of the value from the health technology comes about how it's interacting with the user. If you put a test in, does it actually change a clinician's mind? Does it actually change clinical decision making? Um, do patients interact with digital technologies in the way we think they do? Do the sensors actually st stick to the person as long as we think they do? All that kind of cost of consumables and all that type of thing. 
we can get that information from this interim step of putting it in the practice and pulling all that information back into this, um, back into our evidence and things. And all this value value assessment that we've been doing this year, um, we've done. I think we've launched 13 pilot studies. Um, we've done in partnership with NHS England and MHRA and really collaborating as well. So it's much a step in the right direction, I think, in terms of how we all work and more aligned together. I think in terms of the pilots as well, in terms of NICE, we would historically, I think, design all the processes and methods and put them out in the public domain for consultation and then launch into actually doing. We haven't done that this time. We think the pressure on the NHS and we want to be more agile. We have just launched into doing pilot assessments making sure we've got sound decision making and assessment and then just seeing how we go and getting live feedback from how people are receiving it um, in the ground and how it works with partnerships so it's been a really brilliant way of learning all the information we know much more quickly than we would in a previous um, approach that we would have done within NICE so lots of things in here I think in terms of how we're um, approaching things quite differently as an organisation. Um, I give it to put a, a couple of case studies that we have that have been published um, some of them got really good coverage actually it's been received quite warmly this this approach that we have. Um, first one was sort of in mental health that we've recommended digital CBT for children and young people. Um, the health social care secretary is quite interested in this one. Um, but it's really brilliant technology. They, you know, they sort of use games and um, children can become an avatar and it helps them manage their emotions and all that type of thing. Some really clever thinking in terms of science and state of the art things coming through. Um, and we also recommended a geometric test to prevent newborn um, deafness as well, which um, was mentioned this morning. Um, and we've been working with NHS England on that one as well. So we are at the stage of we've done the evaluation, we've got the guidance out, um, and now there's a lot more learning in terms of how we get these implemented, how do we dock into procurement, are we providing the right information? So still pulling lots of information back from these pilots, we're sort of midway through them at the moment. Um, but to go into more detail on these, just in terms of how it's worked I mean, from a committee perspective in making decisions. Um, to sort of, so for this one with sort of newborn deafness, what we're really looking for from the evidence is to sort of balance the difference between benefit and the risk of introducing something early where maybe you're not quite fully certain about the effectiveness or how it actually may implement. So we looked at this in terms of we know that it's clinical benefit that if a, if a child is sensitive to antibiotics there is an alternative that they can be used that's equally beneficial. So we know there's benefit in sort of testing for these, there's no sort of harms in that sense from a medicine perspective. There wasn't anything else in the market available at the moment for the test for this unmet need so it's a real, with those, these test, children are not being tested at the moment. So that was another piece that was sort of an unmet need that sort of made us think it would be a good thing to put into practice and test out. And also resources-wise, um, it's sort of some, quite a lot of savings could be saved from cochlear implants and things. So even though the cost of the testing could be easily offset by the um, avoidance of having to treat these um, children as well if they did become deaf. So there's lots of sort of benefits of putting into practice early and very little low risk really in terms of the, it's not an invasive, it's not side effects in creation in the child or anything like that. Um, and then managing the risk of early access, one of the things we were really aware of was time to antibiotics. So um, for children, we want to make sure that a test doesn't interfere with sort of being able to give antibiotics within the hour. So the test we had here had to be rapid, and we wanted to check and that it didn't affect sort of on the clinical practice side of things. And um, there was a large study that suggested it didn't, um, so we sort of trusted that, but we also want a bit more information about does that work as well in different settings. If it's in a smaller unit, are we seeing the same? So it's sort of a check on there on the real-world data bringing that in from the um, system. Um, in terms of antibiotic resistance, this is the other thing. Um, the antibiotics that can be used for these children who are sensitive are not in routine use, because obviously we don't want to trigger antibiotic resistance to having lots and lots of antibiotics in the system. Um, so we want to make sure there's no in unintended consequences of increasing prescribing of those um, where it's not necessary. So that's another piece that was put into the evidence generation plan to pull those, um, that information back in from the system technical performance as well of the test so this this variant in children is not that common so there's there's not a huge amount of data out there for the accuracy of the test so we want to see if we can get more information on that um, and also cost consequence that people need to think about was that the test is sort of the capital cost is reasonably high and um, so there will be some cost out there in sort of pressing in paying the test so um, we put in just to make sure that you don't sign really long contracts and things until we actually check that it really is working and everything back in a few years. So just sort of signals to the NHS to try and be helpful, sort of com communicate all the information we learn from NICE through doing these assessments. Um, and also the last one was equality. So we made a recommendation also just to look at this, if there's an ethnic variation in this, in this genetic variant as well. Could we get some data on that, see if it works? So kind of promote that equality um, attendance to get more evidence in on that as well through our guidance and things. So this was a really well received piece of guidance and it was a really nice kind of simple approach for us um, in delivering this um, for the NHS. Um, the other area was um, mental health that we did. 
Um, so this has been so widely reported in the NHS. There's a huge um, in pressure on the NHS in mental health since the pandemic, and particularly in children and young people. Um, and we looked at this one for digital CBT. Um, so again, they're not invasive. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Again, they're not invasive. They are things that people can interact with. Um, but there's, you know, the evidence is growing. It's not all there yet. We don't know if they're actually um, fully effective in all. So we wanted to look at um, whether there's sort of different severity of mental health and where they actually fit best in sort of looking at this. But equally, the unmet need is so great um, that it's sort of worth putting them to practice and managing it within the pathway. Um, so the way we looked at this in terms of mental health was in terms of benefits. Um, the digital CBT, obviously, it could increase access at price a considerable amount if we're not waiting face to face. So there's a lot of, we looked at this to recommend if children and young people who are maybe not accessing care at the moment or are on a waiting list. Um, so initial treatment option to see if it works for them. While, and they can just use this while they're waiting to get the face-to-face -face CBT. And we also think that some of them may not need the face-to-face -face CBT or may not need an alternative treatment. We may find there's quite a population where this is actually enough to help them get better. Um, so that's sort of the information we're pulling in on that. Clinical benefit, as I've just described, you know, there's some evidence to say this works. Um, and also resources um, side of this is, is looking at... Um, if you can, you can put this into a digital CPT, you don't have the same provision of service, etc. So there's some savings in that in terms of resources. If you can triage the whole population to different treatments that are best suited to them, you can remove the burden on those other treatment options as well. So again, just helping the system um, to provide support and care in a different way. Um, and also in equality, we discovered as well that actually we heard from patients that um, people with neurodiversity um, might prefer to interact with a digital technology rather than a person. And also that some children engage engage better with a digital technology than they do with a person as well in terms of they're comfortable speaking to, um, sorry, they're comfortable interacting with it more than they are a, a person as well. So there's lots in there that sort of made these look like a really promising technology that we wanted to introduce. Um, in terms of managing risk of early access, what we were really careful about with these was that there's an awful lot of digital apps that are probably a little bit more in the wellbeing space than maybe the mental health space, but they're sort of very conflated into one group of things. Um, so what we wanted to look at this is that make sure that anyone's accessing these technologies is assessed first so that we know how severe their mental health condition is and not everyone's aware of how severe they are or maybe they're in the mild moderate um, assessment as well so we wanted them assessed first so we put them with a guided self-help they have to go through an assessment and that could be in a school it could be any profession um, qualified person to do that so it's still sort of increasing the early access but not in a really free-for-all way that wouldn't necessarily take care of the, the child um, and again, on the clinical support, we also put in the pathway that there had to be some sort of check-in as well to check. So the risk with these technologies is that if they didn't work at all, that somebody could deteriorate and that wouldn't have to be picked up. So they, if we manage the risk on this by putting this in a pathway of care, so they make sure there are checks and things, but it's not as frequent as it would be if it was in sort of a person-centred um, approach to treatment. Um, the third one was just sort of individual choice, so they don't have to, people don't have to use a digital if they don't want to, they can wait and use other treatment options as well, it wasn't a sort of a, there was some concern about we might be saying palm people off on digital, that is not the case, this is a recognised potential alternative treatment option, so we're really clear to make sure that that was um, communicated in the guidance, um, and as I said we've managed the risk in the care pathway by making sure um, it's all sort of fitted into the services and mental health. And the last one was just around costs as well, so just again to make sure that um, don't necessarily sign up to really long contracts or anything like that, just to see how that um, plays out on, on some of that thing. So we're sort of managing that and working with NHS England as well to see how we can uh, make sure the risks are managed as well. Um, and lastly, so on just on this one, sort of um, impact, there's sort of about a million children we think might be eligible for these technologies, so it could reach a real lot of people and offer benefit if they work. Um, as we've said, the service is in huge demand, so it's a good alternative um, to looking at this type of thing and a good reason for why. Um, and also the early treatment could reduce demand on the other services as well. So this was sort of all the impact and what drove the recommendations behind it all, really. Um, in terms of next steps for this, what we're looking now is early value assessment is going to become business as usual. So as I said, we're gathering information from pilots and we're going to bring it all into one big formal off and learn and make sure it's all linked up into the system much better. Um, and also sort of establish what the ethos we've created in NICE. So my team always sort of say this cartoon reminds me of what it's been like, sort of rapidly putting the track down behind to see, kind of keep pace with it all. So it's quite a good analogy of what happened. But yeah, sort of not moving away that, just being a lot more quick and sort of leaving some feedback from NICE about making sure that we keep pace with everything as well. So that's, um, that's what we have for the, from the NICE pilot things. <laughs>